What is up guys, it's your boy Rick Kakis and today we have the complete King's Fall Raid Guide for Dummies showcasing every single mechanic of every single encounter, secret chests, tips, tricks, loadouts, everything you need to know for how to overcome this challenge and beat the King's Fall Raid re-added to Destiny 2 within Season of Plunder. And so let's get started. But really quick, as you can imagine, making these guides is a huge amount of work. If you enjoy this content, please remember to support it by liking and especially sharing. And hey, if I can teach you an entire raid, I can teach you a lot of other stuff, so consider subscribing. All right, now we're gonna start things off with the first encounter to kind of get into the raid. This takes place in the old school court of orcs on the Dreadnought, and what you're going to need to do is divide your team into two teams of three and you're going to shoot through this first barricade that's going to open up the locations where you need to plant the orbs. So now you need to go and get the orbs. Well, one team of three heads to the right, and the other team of three heads to the left, and that's where we went. Now, as you journey through these hallways, eventually you're gonna see a taken orb and you can grab this and then you wanna start heading back the way you came. However, as you're doing so, there's actually gonna be barriers that are placed on your route. So you're going to have to shoot the taken blights in the middle of this barrier, as you can see me do, to open it up and let you get back to where you started. Now, eventually you're gonna make your way again back to that uh, beginning and both teams will have collected their taken orbs. So they go to one of the relics, as you can see that has kind of the glowing, uh, you know, sphere and they plant at relatively the same time. It doesn't have to be exactly the same time, but you don't want one person to be five seconds ahead of the other person. So once you slam both of these taken orbs on this relic, you're done one relic. You have five more. Here's the thing, the location of those taken spheres that you grabbed, they're going to change. And essentially they're gonna progressively get further and further and further away. So you're gonna have to like keep going, you know, through more doors, down more hallways to find those orbs, and it's a longer journey back. But for every set of orbs, the mechanics are identical. Both teams grab them, meet in the middle, three, two, one, plant, and then simply do it again, grab more orbs. So once you've slammed enough orbs, you've done all six of these statues, you're going to see a bunch of hive spawn in this middle front area. You kill those hive and then a portal will open to teleport you into the actual location of the raid, but you will actually get some loot for doing this. But moving on from there, we get to the first jumping puzzle. So essentially there's going to be hive ships flying all over the place and how you complete this puzzle is by knowing the precise route to go, knowing which hive ships to jump to. So I'm just gonna, in the background, play the exact route you guys need to take. All right, now once you've gotten to the other side, you're going to see two different plates that you can stand on and then they will start glowing. Here's the one on the left and there's a matching one over on the right side. Now, if two people are standing on these two plates, it is going to open up essentially the hive barrier that's in front of you in this giant doorway. So 
Normally how you progress through here is you have two people holding open uh, these two plates. Everyone else jumps on the hive ship right in the middle. The hive ship takes you right through the doorway and then there's another section where you can jump off and there's two more plates and holding open those two plates will keep the barrier open. So the two people that held the barrier open on the first section jump on the ship and now they can ride it through. However, we also have our first secret raid chest here. As you're about to reach this barrier, you simply jump off to the left and as you can see, you scale up the side of this wall and there's a little doorway you can go through. And this doorway, importantly, it will only open if those two people are on those plates I talked about earlier. So it'll open up the giant barrier and this small door, which lets you pass through to the other side, grab the chest, as you can see, and again, you can kind of hop down uh, to this second section to hold open the pl uh, plate slash doors for everyone else. Then you're gonna continue forward, take a very violent hive elevator, and then finally, we have our first main encounter here. So, your objective is going to be to essentially decrypt the different hive ruins on this massive door which will eventually open up and let you into the next encounter. So, how do you do this? Well, there's going to be two separate rooms, one off to the right and one off to the left. Both of them will have annihilator totems in there. So, as you can see right here, they will start to glow a very violent red color. If someone isn't standing near them, they will explode and wipe your team. But if you just kind of walk in here to those totems, you'll also die in this room. So what you need to actually do is grab this buff. As you can see, it's like a floating orb here. And that is going to give you a protective shield, the brand of the weaver for 30 seconds. This lets you stand in this room without dying and you just hold out near the totem. Now, importantly, when you're here, you don't need to like literally be underneath the totem. You can, you know, go away to grab some ammo and come back. But as long as you're passing by the totem with some regularity, you will be fine. However, of course, what happens when your buff wears out? Well, if that happens, uh, you're just gonna die, actually. So, you're also going to notice that while you have this buff, any kills you get is gonna give you the Death Singer's power buff. And so you're gonna start out with one, you get another kill, times two, you get a Galahorn, now it's up to times seven, right? So, that is what you're trying to do, is as you're holding out here near the Annihilator Totem, you're trying to get kills to get as much of the Death Singer's power buff as you can. Now, it's up to the rest of your team to actually rescue you from dying when the timer wears out. So how does that look? Well, the rest of your team, while you're slaying out near the totem, they're in kind of the middle of the map, as you can see right here. And their job is to jump up here and kill the wizards that spawn. As the second the wizard dies, then a taken yellow bar knight is going to spawn. You kill this knight and it's going to drop a taken sphere and you will see the option to pick up the brand claimer. So you want to do this and then you get the brand claimer buff and that will also last for 30 seconds. But you want to absolutely sprint to your teammate holding out on the Annihilator Totem because you're actually gonna get to him and as you can see, it's going to give you the option to interact with him and essentially take his buff. So you steal his brand and then you're freeing him from the buff basically and then you have Brand of the Weaver for 30 seconds. So now you are holding out on this Annihilator Totem. And so that's how that has to work. Your teammates are gonna be up at the middle of the map. They're going to be killing those Taken Knights, grabbing the Brand Claimers, and going and rotating with the people that are holding out on the Annihilator Totems and preventing a wipe. However, there's also the matter of the Death Singer's power buff that you get for killing enemies. What is that all about? Well, as you've been holding out, getting all those kills, then you're saved by a teammate, you switch places, you head to the middle and you stand on this very central middle plate. And as you do, you're actually gonna see your Death Singer's power buff slowly decrease. So you stand here until it's literally gone. Every 10-ish, I believe, will decode one ruin. So if you slay out in the Annihilator Totem Room, that's fantastic. So as soon as all of that buff is gone, 
then you jump up, kill the wizard, kill the taken knight, get the brand claimer buff to go and free whoever is holding out on the annihilator totem. So obviously it's splitting your team in half again, three to each side, and it's essentially gonna work that one person's holding out the totem, the next person is dropping off their Death Singer's power in the middle, the other person is killing the Taken Knight and kind of rotating to the Annihilator totem, and you just have each person doing that job one after another. So those are the mechanics, but some big tips for this encounter is that firstly, you will have to deal with unstoppable champions. So put on something like a pulse rifle or whatever weapon type can use unstoppable rounds for the season you're watching this video in. In addition to that, if you played this in Destiny 1, it was the job of the people in the middle dropping off Death Singer's power to slay out on ads so they didn't overwhelm the people in the Annihilator Totem. But now, you actually kind of don't want to do that. You want to let, especially the Thralls, go by you. Don't kill them because you want the people holding out on the totem to have as many adds as possible to kill. It may be a good idea to at least wound the knights that will spawn because you don't, again, want the people on the totems to get overwhelmed. But yeah, seriously, try to avoid killing adds in the middle except for, obviously, the wizard that spawns that taken knight. And so guys, there you have it. You just have to keep doing the rotation until you have enough Death Singer's power activated to decode the door, and then we get to the War Priest encounter. So, immediately upon entering this arena, you're going to notice that there's three different plates. One is on the upper left, one is in the bottom middle, and one is over a little bit up to the right. So, you need to split your team into three teams of two, each group covering one of these plates. And you start the encounter by all three plates having someone standing on them. Once this happens, a bunch of adds are going to spawn, so don't worry about the plates for now. Simply slay out on these adds. Eventually, you'll have yellow bar wizards spawn. You want to kill them because doing so is going to spawn yellow bar knights. And when everyone kills their yellow bar knights, and there's going to be these knights on all three locations of this arena, basically near all three of the plates, then you're going to see in the corner of your screen, Glyph reading sequence started. And this is a big departure from Destiny 1. This is going to give you the chance to see the order of the actual Glyph entering sequence. So when you see this, the person in the very bottom middle, it's always the person in the bottom middle, they are going to stand on the plate. And as you can see, I can actually see from standing on this plate, essentially, all three of the totems. Those are the big pillars of rock in front of all three of these plates. And as you can see, like the one on the right is just a normal rocky plate, but the one on the left, the front part of it is actually glowing. And again, only me standing on this plate can actually see this. So I stand on the middle plate, I look up, and in this case, the left one is glowing. So that tells me that we're gonna start the actual glyph entering sequence with the left plate. Obviously, if I don't see anything glowing, that means we start it with the middle. Like it's the one in front of me. Obviously, that's the one that's glowing that I can't see. So then once I figure this out, I need to step off the plate. That's really important. And then you'll actually see glyph sequence started. So again, it's like one opportunity to figure out the order and then you step off and then the actual entering begins. So in this case, the person on the left stands on their plate and from their perspective, they have to figure out the next person who stands on the plate. So I'm figuring out the first person they stand and they're figuring out the second person in this order. So obviously they can look over from, in this case, the top left, and they can see the glowing front portion of the right, or again, if it's not glowing, if they don't see anything, it's obviously the middle. So in this case, it was the right, right steps on, and then obviously there's only three options, so I'm on last, and that is going to activate the boss DPS phase. So just remember that the reading phase is just for the bottom middle guy to figure out who starts first, then they step off and the actual entering phase begins with the first guy to step on, he figures out the second guy, and then obviously the third guy just steps on. However, once this happens and all three people are on in the correct order, one person will have a big red sphere surrounding them and have a new buff. 
The buff is called Brand of the Initiate, it has a timer, and this lets you actually damage the boss. You have a little bit of a bubble around you, and your teammates have to be standing within this bubble to also damage the boss. But if you all just start damaging, eventually the timer is going to run up, your ability to do damage is going to go away, and you probably won't have done that much damage. And that's because you need to actually extend the Brand of the Initiate buff. Now, how do you do this? Well, the second the final plate is stood on and the brand of the initiate buff is given to one person, a taken knight will spawn again. So if you see this taken knight, kill it and it's going to give you that brand claimer buff again. So what you want to do with brand claimer is as you can see, hop in the bubble, maybe even do some damage if you have time, and then the person with the main brand of the initiate buff is going to count down, okay, five, four, three, two, and then just before they're done at like two seconds, you hold and steal their buff just like you did with the Annihilator Totem. And when you do that, it's going to reset the timer. So now you have the Brand of the Initiate buff and your team can keep damaging. However, when this happens, there's actually another Taken Knight that's going to be spawning. So someone has to peel away and kill that second Taken Knight, get another Brand Claimer, go back to the middle, and then steal the buff at the last second again, and then you will get a third extension of this damage phase, which is why you had Brand of the Initiate times 3 initially. However, something very important, my description of the timing was actually a bit off. What you need to do is the second the first Taken Knight is killed, not when you transfer the buff, the second that knight is killed and someone picks up the brand claimer, they need to call that out and someone else needs to peel away and find that new taken knight. Because if you don't do it at that very moment, you won't have enough time. Those like 10 seconds are going to run out before you're able to go and claim that buff. So you've done all this, you've extended your damage phase, things are going well, well, Eventually you will run out of time and then everything's going to start glowing white. And this means that you want to actually hide in the shadow of these rocky pillars. So if you're DPSing from the bottom middle, then you hide kind of behind that bottom middle pillar. You guys will see the light is pouring out on either side and it will actually eventually destroy this middle pillar. If you are not in the shadow of a pillar, you'll die. It's an instant wipe. So make sure you're hiding behind it. But that also means that once the pillar is destroyed, you can't DPS from there again because there's no pillar to hide behind. It's been destroyed. So what you're going to have to do, for example, is DPS from the top left, hide behind that pillar. Then the next DPS phase, go to the middle, hide behind that pillar. Then you're going to go to the right side, hide behind that pillar. And you technically have one more DPS phase, but you better kill them then because there's no more pillars to hide behind. Now, in case you're wondering, wait, if the pillars are destroyed, how are they going to glow and we tell the order? Well, there's just going to be a glowing red thing in the place of the pillar if it's that person's turn to go. All right, so those are the mechanics of this encounter, but that's really just one half of the challenge. This is a huge DPS check. So linear fusion rifles were fantastic, especially the brand new world drop one that you can craft. And in fact, there's a quest that will get you the pattern to craft it guaranteed. That thing has Vice Stinger, so put on triple tap plus firing line and frankly that was like the main heavy weapon i was using throughout this entire raid it's fantastic but sniper rifles are great as well you need stuff that do a ton of damage over a long distance because you need to be dpsing from kind of the bottom here behind these stone pillars so you need those long range weapons again snipers linear fusions are amazing when contest mode goes away, you might be able to get away with simple rockets, but we'll see. However, guys, that's what you need to know for War Priest. Let's move on from there. And we actually have another secret raid chest. Now, this one is a bit complicated. So essentially, you are going to get into this area, basically, and it's essentially a labyrinth. Now, 
Up on screen is a 3D map of this labyrinth created by Blake Robinson, so huge shout out uh, to him. But this is essentially what you need to do and what you need to know in order to navigate this area. However, the one big twist, guys, is that the fifth plate that isn't numbered here, this is is going to be needed to get the exotic chest. Whereas before in Destiny 1, it was only the four plates that are uh, ordered and the order of first, second, third is not necessarily guaranteed. So what you wanna do is utilize that map in order to position one teammate on all five of the different plates denoted by again those red circles. Once everyone is near a plate, don't actually stand on them because you then need to find out the sequence. So as you can see, if you stand on it and it's not the right plate to stand on at that time, it will be glowing red. But then if you stand on it and it is the right plate, it'll be glowing green. So you just say, all right, person on plate number one, stand on yours. It's either red or green. You just keep going one person at a time. And then, oh, plate number four, they stood on and it was green. Oh, fantastic. Then they stay on. If your gr plate is green, you stay on. And then everyone else tests one at a time until someone else's glows green, they stay on. The last few people test theirs and then eventually you figure out the order of the plates you need to stand on when everyone eventually is standing on a green plate. That's going to open up the door in the very center here and there is a chest inside. Then simply make your way out and we have the next big encounter, Golgoroth. And oh man, this guy stumped many a raid team back in the day. So what you have to do for this is, first of all, you're going to notice like an orb in the very center of this arena here, almost like an, a droplet of water. If you shoot it, it's going to start to crack. Actually, if you don't, it will heal. So if your team puts enough damage on these orbs and you actually seemingly need to put a pretty significant amount of damage on this, like you might even want to shoot one of your linear shots at this to actually break it, eventually um, you're going to have it drop down and Golgoroth, the big bad boss, is going to spawn. Now, when this is all happening, guys, there is a ton of ads that are going to spawn as well. So go around, be on top of those, just add clear, add clear, add clear, but keep an eye on Golgroth because eventually, as you can see, another droplet of water is going to spawn in a different location and his back is going to open up. And now you can see there is a crit spot, a weak spot in his back. So what's going to happen is that one person, and I was this person, is going to grab Golgroth's gaze. And here's what that looks like. You do enough damage to the back. Again, it actually takes a while to activate, so you probably do need to use your heavy. Just shooting primary at him will take a while. But when you do do enough damage to his back crit, then you're going to see on your screen that he focuses his gaze on whoever did the damage and you'll have Golgroth's gaze as a buff on your screen for a certain amount of time. During this time, Golgroth will stare at you. It, he will not do any other damage to anyone else and constantly shoot out Axion darts at you. So you need to hold out, kill the Axion darts so they don't kill you. But also guys, while you're doing this, the rest of the people, as you're grabbing his gaze, they need to shoot down the water droplet that's hanging on the ceiling and where that drops, they need to go there and start doing damage to Golgroth's stomach as you can see. So this is how you kill the boss, is doing damage to his stomach. But if no one's grabbing the gaze, it won't be open, like you can't even do damage to him. And also, Golgoroth will look at whoever has the gaze. So you might need to go to the back of the map, and you're going to see me do that quite a bit, to grab his gaze, because you need a clear line of sight on his back, but you don't want to stay back there because he'll just turn around, right? So everyone in that water droplet doing damage, suddenly Golgroth won't even be facing them, right? So you need to grab his gaze and then sprint over and essentially align Golgroth with your team so they can do damage to that middle stomach crit area. However, of course, the Golgoroth's gaze timer is going to end, and if it does, the damage phase ends as well. So you actually need a second person that's also the gaze grabber. So you go to the back, 
you know, shoot Goldroth, whoever can get the first shot of the two grabbers, they are going to go to the front, align Goldroth. The other person is kind of waiting in the back, lining up their shot until uh, the buff is low. So the first guy will say, oh, all right, three, two, and then you shoot the back, you grab the gaze, and you align Goldroth with the DPS team, and you keep switching back and forth. So the two gaze grabbers will, like, try to always keep Golgoroth occupied, try to always have that uh, gaze buff. But that is just one half of the puzzle. The DPS crew has a little bit more going on than simply standing in the water droplet and shooting him in the stomach. So first of all, one person, this is very similar to the Atheon mechanic with the detain thing, one person will get the unstable light debuff and they're going to start glowing and there's going to be a ringing sound. You're going to have to pay attention to this because they will actually explode and kill everyone nearby them. So if you're not paying attention, one person will get this blow up and pretty much wipe your team and they'll be the only one left standing so you know whose fault it is. So they want to run away from the group doing DPS and actually they want to run over to Goldroth. I think you actually do damage to Goldroth if you blow up on him but regardless they run away blow up and then they go back to the dps crew to continue dpsing but something very important is that you're not going to be able to stay in that same water droplet forever eventually it's going to run out and during the damage phase especially if it's extended to the max and the two gaze grabbers are doing their job you're gonna see more water droplets spawn in the air. So you need to, when the first one has run out or is about to run out, you need to look up for the next one, shoot that one, it drops down and move over to the, where that second one dropped. Do damage from there. You're gonna be at a slightly different angle. So the gaze grabber needs to align him maybe over to the right this time. Do damage until that runs out hit the next water droplet, go to where that drops down. So you're literally moving from water droplet to water droplet, going to different locations in this arena and damaging Golgroth's stomach crit. Now, importantly, there's a big change again from the Destiny 1 version. There's this totem in the back of the arena and there's different hive runes on here. In Destiny 1, every time someone would die, it would fill up a rune and if six people died, it would wipe the whole team. In Destiny 2, because you just have the res tokens, how it works is if you have leftover water droplets, this fills up this ruin. So if you just stay in the front and maybe you go one water droplet over, but you end the damage phase with two water droplets up on the ceiling, then two ruins out of six will fill up. And when all six fill up, it will wipe your team. So actually something very important is that you want to get as much damage in in the first like three water droplets. But after that point, when the damage phase is winding down, you actually just want to like DPS the water droplets. Kill them as quickly as possible. Obviously go there and do some damage if you can, but you want to end the damage phase with no water droplets up, right? Because you don't want uh, this totem to be completed. Yeah, so there's a lot going on, but eventually you're going to juggle Golgroth's gaze for a certain amount of time. You're going to DPS him moving from droplet to droplet. All that stuff is great. Eventually he will just end the damage phase, right? Like uh, you're going to run out of gazes to grab that his back will close shut. And at this point, everyone hops out of that bottom area and you simply have another phase. So ads are going to spawn. They will actually change to taken like halfway through, um, but more ads are going to spawn. You just clear ads again. And then eventually after clearing enough ads, you're going to notice that his back is open again and you do the whole thing over again. Someone grabs the gaze. Um, the rest of the people Break the water droplets, start DPSing. One person peels away and is the second gaze grabber, grabs it from the first. Those two people juggle it for the entire damage phase while everyone else moves from droplet to droplet doing damage. And guys, that's really all there is to it. I mean, I know it's a lot, but yeah, those are the mechanics of Golgoroth. Uh, again, it's just a huge DPS check, but since you are closer range, you could 
ditch the snipe rifles and linears, um, maybe not linears because they're so easy to use even in close range, but you could potentially run slug shotguns in this encounter, use the Luna Faction boots, exotic for the Warlock, to give you a huge range increase inside your well and rifts, and then those slug shotguns are going to be hitting really hard, again, if you don't want to use snipers. But guys, it's time to move on from there, and we have another jumping puzzle with another secret raid chest. So eventually, you're gonna get outside to this area, and you're gonna see platforms jutting out from the wall, but you're also gonna see these like triangle objects and they will shoot out, as you can see, and send you flying across the map and instantly kill you. You can activate them by getting close, so simply inch closer, then they will shoot and then you can like jump over them or, or wait until they go back and then quickly jump before they go again. There is a little bit of a timer, but they can't just go instantly again as soon as they're reset. And you're going to kind of make your way traveling along these paths here, but you're going to notice those same jutting out paths in the center kind of pillar right here. So jump to one of these paths and then actually take out your ghost Doing so will reveal hidden things you can jump on. So you simply go to these rocks that are appearing as you're taking out your ghost. You might have to jump back to a higher level of the pillar platform, jump to more of these disappearing rocks, and then eventually you can see there's a doorway right here, head inside, and there is yet another chest. Now from here, there's actually kind of a new mechanic. You're gonna see a very large platform with some enemies on it and this one has a plate so as you can see if i stand on this plate it causes a pathway to spawn essentially i need to stand here my teammates use the pathway and then they get to another platform on the other side with another plate and then if they're standing on that plate it's going to hold it open for me so i can kind of go across but that second plate is also going to spawn a new pathway to a third plate and once you're standing on here, it should lock open uh, the pathway as you can see, and now no one needs to stand on the plate. So someone stand on the first one, everyone else pass, get in the second one, everyone pass, get in the third one, and then the people behind kind of catch up. From here, it's simply jumping on more of these platforms and avoiding getting absolutely yeeted across the uh, entire map here. Eventually, you're going to make your way up the Tower of Red Saturation, and when everyone is here, the doors are going to open to the final arena where the final two encounters are going to take place. The first one, we have the Daughters of Oryx. So, you're quickly going to notice that there's four large structures with plates on top of them. Two in the back, two in the front, essentially one for each of the four quadrants of this square-shaped arena. Now, you want to assign one teammate to each of these four plates. Now, that will leave two teammates left over, that's good. And at this point, you can either decide if you want to label each of these plates like R1, L2, or 1, 2, 3, 4, or simply call out the name of the teammate who is assigned to that plate. We did the latter because it's a little bit quicker to learn. Now, one of these plates is going to have a Hive Knight on top of it. This is actually the starting plate. So, shooting your guns will start the encounter, ads are going to spawn, and there is a considerable amount of ads. In fact, we had a lot of us switch to the Trinity Ghoul Exotic Bow. This is fantastic at dealing with adds, especially because they're arc shields as well. And as you can see, there's snipers that spawn as well you need to deal with. And obviously a bow is great for those too. But back to the plates. It's your job to essentially connect two of these four plates. So again, the first one, the starting point, is always going to be where the Hive Knight is. So whoever is assigned to that plate jumps up there, kills the knight, and looks around, and you will see a floating objective marker above someone else's plate. So you call out that person, you say, hey, you know, top left, or the name of your teammate, or whatever, you call them out, and they jump on their plate. That is the correct order. The other two people don't jump on their plate. If there's a bad callout, if you jump on the wrong plates, they will glow red and it will start to damage everyone who's on plates. So, those two people, 
the correct two people keep standing on their plate and then you'll notice that someone else on the team randomly has kind of become a see-through ghost, as you can see right here. This person needs to make the journey between these two plates. So as you can see, there is now a bunch of rocks where you can jump from one to the next, eventually getting to that objective that you as the ghost person can actually see. So you simply stand near it, you'll see that a piece has been completed and it'll disappear and you will fall back to the ground. Everyone can get off the plates as soon as you grab this. In fact, you wanna call out when you've grabbed it because if you stay on the plates past this point, it will damage you, right? And then you basically do the same thing again. Someone else randomly on your team will be torn between dimensions and become see-through. Uh, then someone else is going to have another Hive Knight spawn on their plate and their plate will be glowing green. They hop on there, kill the knight. Uh, the person who is torn between dimensions goes and meets them there because that's always the starting point. They look out and see whose plate has the objective above them. That person hops on their plate. The ghost person makes the journey on the rocks up and collects another piece of this objective. Now, obviously the situation that's going to arise is that people assigned to certain plates are going to randomly be torn between dimensions and they have to make the run. That's what the two flex slot people are doing when they're not just killing ads if you are assigned to a plate and you suddenly become see-through and you go, oh, I have to run, someone switches with you and they go to your plate while you make that journey and then you simply switch back with them. However, on the third time, something different is going to happen. You have another night spawn, that's your starting point, you call out the end point, you make that journey again, but this time you don't just stand over that take an orb, you actually interact with it and pick it up. And it's another brand claimer. So then you actually need to use it to take away the shield of one of the two sisters. And it's always going to be the one that's shooting at you. So the one that's shooting the electric bolts out of her hand that's been trying to kill you this whole time, that is the one you need to go to. And as you can see, you grab their shield and now you have this immunity shield and then it's DPS time. Some people like to DPS like right next to where these two sisters are on this little platform. I hate that to be honest. As you can see, there's so much flinch. So we like to go to the stairs near where you first spawned into this encounter. And from here, you can use your linears, snipers again, do a ton of damage to one of the two sisters, whatever one you took the shield from. So you do a bunch of damage, eventually the phase is going to end, there's actually a wipe mechanic, and if you're not standing within the bubble that's around uh, the person who claimed the brand from one of the two daughters, you will die. So you do need to all be within a relatively close area, putting down wells and all that stuff. That's pretty much what you do for a uh, DPS phase, so you should be fine then you're basically gonna do the exact same thing, but this time you're going to target the other daughter. So whatever one was shooting at you, they're just gonna kind of stand still now and the other one will be shooting at you this time. So same mechanics apply, randomly people will be torn between dimensions, they have to make the journey from the first plate that has the uh, Hive Knight on it, to the other plate that people have to call out. Eventually, after collecting the objective enough times, on the third time, you grab the shield from the daughter shooting at you, you meet again somewhere in the middle, wherever you want, and DPS. Here's something extremely important, guys. If you kill one of the daughters, you have to kill the other one in the next damage phase. So if you kill one, and then you don't have enough ammo the next damage phase to kill the other, you get the other half health, uh, I believe you'll just kind of wipe and die. Like, it just doesn't work. So you may have to get one of the daughters very, very low, and then that way you can damage the other one until she's very low, and then you can finish them off both, no problem. So 
maybe not the best idea to completely DPS the first one down, at least while contest mode is still active. It's kind of a niche tip, but oh boy, it does come up and it can screw over a certain run. So just keep that in mind. And so guys, there you have it. Now it's time for the final raid boss encounter against Big Daddy Oryx. So what do you do here? Well, it's actually pretty similar to the daughter's encounter for a lot of the running and grabbing the objective mechanics. After going to the very front of the arena and spawning in Oryx himself, he's pretty hard to miss, he's a big guy, uh, you're gonna have to watch where he goes. So he's actually gonna move around to someone's plate and slam it as you can see. Soon after he does that, you'll see that their plate will glow green. So him slamming the plate is the new version of the Hive Knight spawning on that plate, right? That is the plate where you start. So whoever is assigned to that plate jumps on, they look around for the objective above someone else's plate, they call it out, that other person jumps on their plate, and the same mechanics occur. A random person will be torn between dimensions, uh, they have to make the journey between those two plates and find that piece of the Blight Guard. However, while they're doing that, everyone else has some very important jobs to do. First of all, you need to keep on top of ad clearing yet again, but second of all, you're going to notice that yellow bar ogres spawn near your plates in the same spot every single time. When you see these ogres, you need to melt them as quickly as possible. Then when you do kill them, you'll see they drop a taken orb essentially, a taken sphere. Do not go in here, like stay far away from this for now. Once you've actually done that, this is gonna trigger another enemy to spawn, the Light Eater Knight. So they're going to spawn in kind of the back of the map. You can see me killing some here on the opposite side of the ogre they're heading for. So if I kill my ogre, I'm on the back left side here, my knight is going to spawn in kind of the back of the map on the right side and just beeline it for that taken sphere that spawned for my ogre. If the knight gets there, then they will essentially eat that sphere, they will destroy it, and that's really, really bad. You want all four spheres going into the damage phase. So you wanna kill your ogre as quickly as possible and then keep on the lookout for those Light Eater Knights, kill them as quickly as possible as well. But while you're keeping busy with Ogres, Knights, and Adds, you're also jumping on the plates in that correct order. So again, that whole mechanic from Daughters will still be happening. People will randomly be torn between dimensions, and have to make the journey from one plate to the other to collect the objective. However, after Oryx slams, that's the first very obvious plate you start at, he's only gonna slam once. So once that person makes that journey and grabs that objective, how do you know where to start next? Well, after that, just someone's plate is going to start glowing green. So simply look for that if you are torn between dimensions, like if you become see-through, just like jump around, look for whoever's plate has a glow, you're gonna be seeing in black and white, so it's just whoever plate is actually glowing, but you wanna head there, call it out, say, oh, your plate, hop on, and then you hop on and look for where to go next, and then again, make that journey. And same thing applies. On the third journey to the floating taken orb, then it's actually going to be the thing you have to collect and now you head down to the middle of the map. You're going to see this enemy here, the Vessel of Oryx. He has a glowing kind of shield around him, somewhat similar to the Daughters. Um, you sometimes can't see it until you get closer, but I digress. If you are the person who made that final journey, you picked up the brand claimer, you hop down, you take his shield, you claim his brand, then you can actually damage this Vessel before he would be immune. You DPS the crap out of him, kill him, and right around the time you're killing him, you wanna do this as quickly as possible, you're going to see the text appear on your screen, Oryx calls upon the darkness. So kill the vessel and everyone go to the taken blight that was near your assigned plate. 
Unless you're the guy who stole the brand, then you stay in the very middle and someone just switches with you and goes to the blight near your plate. So you see this text, orcs calls upon the darkness, then you go, all right guys, three, two, one, everyone goes inside here right next to the blight. Then you're gonna see in the left corner of your screen, your gamer tag or your name has detonated a corrupted blight. The second you see this, you run to the middle inside this protective shield because Oryx, as you can see, is Kamehameha-ing. He's gonna have this huge clap of energy and wipe anyone who's outside of this protective bubble. So again, everyone has to go to where they killed those ogres and detonate those corrupted lights and run back to the very middle. Everyone's inside the shield and if everyone is inside the shield, you will survive the white mechanic and then you can see that Oryx's chest will start opening up and you can now officially move to damaging Oryx. Uh, in Destiny 1, the detonation of those lights did the most damage. Here, no, you still have to do damage to Oryx. So again, like sniper rifles, linears are amazing for this. And uh, Wither Horde did actually work against Oryx. So if you have a lot of heavy ammo, you can Wither Horde and then combine that with a linear for some huge DPS. But eventually the damage phase will end and we have two more potential mechanics and then we're done, I promise. But one of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to see the Taken Knights that spawn at the beginning of your plates, I think at the beginning of the encounter, they're gonna spawn again and Oryx is gonna really go back from the platform. If you see this happening, if you see those knights spawning, you want to start sprinting in circles around your assigned plate. And if you're one of the floaters, you just kind of go up and down the map or in circles somewhere else. And as you can see, there's going to be essentially these explosions that are spawning all around you. As long as you keep moving, you keep sprinting and don't cross paths with other teammates who are doing the same, you will survive this one of two potential scenarios. So once that's all done, you go back to normal, right? Uh, you look to where Oryx is gonna slam, you start there, you start running and collecting uh, the blight pieces, uh, and you're also killing ogres, knights, all that stuff, blah, 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 that's fine. You do the same thing you just did to get to the damage phase again. But another potential scenario might happen. If no Taken Knight spawn, instead Oryx is going to summon a big Taken Blight kind of in the front middle of this arena and he's going to start randomly teleporting people inside. If you do get inside, as you can see, you have this crazy uh, location and there's going to be a shade of Oryx. You want to damage this guy whenever you see him, he's going to randomly like spawn around the outskirts in the smoke. So it can be hard to track him down, but whenever you do see him, damage him, he will run in sometimes and smack you with a big sword. So watch out for that. But if you don't kill this guy, it will wipe your team. So you do have to do enough damage to kill this shade. Once you do, everyone gets teleported out and then you do the same thing to get to a damage phase over again. But importantly, if you are outside, if you haven't been teleported inside, then what you're going to do is kill the thralls because the thralls are making their way inside. So if you can kill them before they get inside, it's easier for the people inside to focus on the Shade of Oryx. So after one of those two potential scenarios happen, again, you do the same mechanics to get back to a damage phase. Eventually, you will get Oryx into Final Stand. Now importantly, once he goes into Final Stand, you have to kill him. So you might want to edge Oryx, like get him just before the Final Stand bar, so then you can grab, you know, try to get some ammo from enemies and so on, and you have enough to take him down. Because once he gets into that Final Stand, you have to take him down. So if you're running low on ammo, again, like make sure to consider edging him and not tipping him over that final stand bar. But here's what's gonna happen for final stand. Oryx is going to move to the front middle again where he uh, spawned originally and you started this encounter and you have the chance to DPS him again. However, two more ogres are gonna spawn, one on the front left and one on the front 
right. And the timing is pretty critical here. So you need to have people kill them as quickly as possible. I'm talking like super them down, right? You wanna kill them, melt them as quickly as possible, get right next to their blights. And then again, you have to wait for the text Oryx calls upon the darkness. The second you see that, the two people who melted the ogres that are standing beside the Blights jump inside, they detonate them, and they run back to the very center to the protection of the Band of Immortality. From here, guys, get to DPSing Oryx one last time, and hopefully you can do enough damage to finish him off for good. You're gonna kill him, and there it is. You've killed Oryx and officially beaten the King's Fall Raid. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video, found it informative. If you did, please remember to help me out by rating and especially sharing this video. If you guys want to see more Destiny 2 content similar to this, don't be afraid to slap that subscribe button. If you want to get in touch with me and keep up to date with the latest channel activity, the best way is to follow me on Twitter at Rick Kakis, that is linked in the description down below. Again, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, have a good day.